Good morning to everyone. I'm Tomasz Zwolenski, and I'm a product manager at RF Element. And today we'll continue in our mini series on sector antennas. And we'll talk about the patch race. So in our previous webinar, a few weeks back, we, we talked about horn antenna sectors. But one of the most used uh, sector antennas uh, that WISPs uh, deploy or choose to deploy in their networks are also patch array antennas. So today we'll, we'll dedicate this webinar to, to patch arrays. And if you, if you missed our first webinar about the horns, uh, make sure to check our YouTube channel where you can find a recording of this webinar. So you have a, a complete comparison of both technologies. And before we go into the, into the topic directly, um, make sure you, you actually write down the questions uh, that, uh, as they pop. Um, in, your, in your webinar tool, there is a section for questions and answers. So make sure to write them there and we'll get to them um, after the presentation is over. So what makes a great sector antenna? And there are many parameters antennas have, of course, but it, uh, it makes sense to actually consider which parameters are important for WISP networks and why. So because the noise or interference is the number one problem in WISP networks, you definitely want a impeccable beam performance, yeah, meaning minimum side lobes and, um, and really exact radiation angles and, uh, and similar properties. But on the other hand, also, also again, because of the noise, um, you, you want to consider what's the maximum gain you want to use. And of course, WISPs use quite a wide bandwidth. So you know the, the bandwidth antennas work in uh, should, should cover at least the bandwidth the radios are working in. And also to provide a stable and reliable uh, service to your customers, you want your antennas to, to simply have very low frequency dependence of their, uh, of their properties which it turns into a reliable and stable service you provide to your customers. And there are many other parameters that, that go into consideration. But of course, we understand that being a WISP, you're actually multi multitasking uh, between, between all kinds of, uh, all kinds of um, tasks every single day. So you might not have the time to, um, to give a proper care and thought to, to each deployment. And that's perfectly fine, of course, but uh, just know that you know whenever you have the time and space to to actually look into into the choice of the antenna more carefully, that the recording of this webinar will be also available on our YouTube channel, where you can access it anytime you need. And there are great differences in uh, performance and all other properties between the, the horn sectors and the patch array sectors, because these two antennas are fundamentally different. Uh, there are different types of antennas working uh, on different physics principles. So their performance really differs uh, in all, pretty much almost all the parameters that we're looking at. And of course, um, again, Based on these differences in the in, in the physics uh, and performance, also the you know, suitability of each antenna type uh, is varying depending on the uh, on the frequency range they're used in and the application. So let's go to the patch array antennas as advertised. So first of all, why do we call these antennas patch arrays? It is because uh, they're composed of a number of patches. And this single patch uh, is a basic radiating element of each, um, each antenna array, in this case, patch array. And as you see, it's, a, it's a simply a, a metal sheet etched on a surface of a printed circuit board in a particular shape. But as soon as we stack one, I mean, two or more patches above each other and feed them uh, with, the, with the same signal, 
uh, we call it an array. And this is actually valid regardless what, uh, uh, what is the single radiating element. But in this case, because we use the single patch, patch antenna, uh, it's called patch array. So let's look closer at a single patch. So patch array antenna is, uh, is a resonant type of an antenna, which means that if its length is equal to half of the wavelength of the, of the feeding signal, it resonates, yeah? which means practically means that the, the antenna radiates the RF signal into the space. Yeah, and this, uh, this resonance is a phenomenon connected to the size of the, of the patch. Yeah, so when uh, the size of the patch, again, is half of the wavelength, the uh, patch array antenna starts to radiate. And as I mentioned, uh, because the, uh, the size of the patch determines the resonant frequency, uh, we can play around with it. So as you see, uh, when, we're, when we're, for example, now decreasing the size of the patch, the resonant frequency is increasing. And vice versa, if the if the size of the patch is growing, the resonant frequency is decreasing. This is a very typical scenario and and very common in RF engineering, where uh, the size uh, of an antenna and its resonant frequency are are uh, are actually counter dependent. So if uh, frequency is increasing, then the size is decreasing, and vice versa. And besides the size of the, of the patch itself, um, there is also other parameters that influence the, the properties of the resulting antenna. So, and those are the properties of the substrate, yeah, the printed circuit board on which the patch is etched. So the height of the patch influences the, the resonant frequency and the amount of parasitic radiation uh, one sees from this antenna. And the second uh, parameter of the, of the dielectric or, or the, the substrate itself is its permittivity. And this is, a, this is a number which tells us how strongly the material of which the, the PCB is made influences the radiation or influences the electromagnetic wave. And in effect, it influences the, uh, how big the size is of the patch or can be, and also the bandwidth of the resulting antenna. And uh, the substrate itself also has losses. You know, so some power inevitably gets dissipated in the substrate itself. And this is uh, expressed in, by the tangent delta, which in eventually results into, into varying gain. So the bigger the tangent, loss tangent, of course, the smaller the, the resulting gain of the antenna and vice versa. And this uh, is an example how substrates uh, used for manufacturing of uh, patch ray antennas look like. So it's a thin sheet of uh, some sort of material you know, which has metallization, most commonly copper on the, on the top or even bottom surfaces. Yeah, depends. I mean, there is great variety of the substrates and um, the quality can differ, of course. And um, naturally the less lossy uh, substrate is the more expensive it becomes, and also the higher the the relative permittivity uh, is the the more expensive it becomes as well, and so on. And as you can see, the patch antennas can have various shapes, and these are not uh, not uh, you know they're just for fun. Like each of these shapes has, uh, you know, results into specific properties of the resulting patch array antenna. Yeah, these different various cutouts you can, or, or shapes, you know, these sharp shapes uh, really influence the properties like bandwidth you know, or, uh, or, or the, the, the gain of the resulting antenna and so on. So how does a single patch antenna radiate? And here you can see the 3D radiation diagram of a single patch antenna. So because it's a, it's a small element, I mean, electrically compared to the wavelength, its radiation pattern is similar to that of a dipole. Yeah? But because of the presence of that, uh, of that ground plane, 
most commonly, uh, the radiation is sort of pushed up. Yeah? So we see that uh, on the bottom, the, the radiation pattern or the gain is quite, uh, quite small, it's weak, and, and the patch antenna radiates mostly in the upward direction or the per perpendicular direction to the, uh, to the substrate itself. And there are a few properties uh, which, uh, which uh, basically make a single patch array and, uh, or a patch antenna um, an insufficient antenna for uh, for application in west networks so one of them is that fixed beam width you know because a single patch antenna uh, is just one radiating element uh, there is really not much we can do about the beam width it's most fixed and quite wide and it's kind of has this mushroomy shape you know? so there is uh, that's really not so favorable for a sectorial or point-to-point -point application in west networks and on the other hand also the gain of this antenna is typically quite low. But I mean, of course, it's higher than the than a single dipole simply because of the presence of that uh, of that ground plane. Another not so favorable property of the of the single patch antenna is uh, that its beam width is, I mean bandwidth is usually quite narrow. And that's because the resonance, you know, the phenomenon, phenomenon which makes the patch radiate, is a narrow band phenomenon, meaning that it only the patch antenna only radiates in a narrow band of frequencies around the resonant frequency. In this example, you can see that uh, the highlighted bandwidth is around 500 megahertz, and that's that's because. Um, um that's simply because the um right of course the 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 resonance is not like a super narrow frequency right so there is also some span of frequencies around the resonance that um in which it which it actually works but of course as wisps uh, you use much wider spectrum you know because the radios uh, you use in your networks work uh, typically uh, within even like one gigahertz and beyond. Yeah? So obviously 500 megahertz is not enough. So the solution to, um, to these properties is to make a patch array. Let's have a detailed look at that. So as you add more patches on top of each other, you start seeing the, uh, the radiation pattern changing. So obviously, first thing is that the gain is growing yeah? because more patches means bigger aperture and that means higher gain. And the second, um, second thing you'll notice is that uh, the, the, the shape of the main beam is also changing. Yeah, so as we, in this example, as we stack the patches in the vertical direction above each other, we see that the, the beam width is changing in the, in the elevation plane. And so it's counterintuitive. One would sort of intuitively assume that if I, if I stack them in the vertical direction, the, uh, the beam width will also be uh, narrowing in the vertical direction, but it's actually the opposite. So uh, that's one of the things that are, that are, sort of counterintuitive in our engineering, but it's just a fact to, to get used to, really. There's nothing, nothing strange about it. But we can also stack the patches in a, in a, in a surface, not only in horizontal or vertical direction. So as you stack more and more patches in the, on a surface, yeah, uh, you'll see that the, the beam width is actually increasing or Shrinking, sorry, is shrinking not only in vert in, uh, in elevation but also the azimuth plane. Yeah? So we are basically forming a very narrow pencil-shaped beam. Um, but another thing we'll see is also that the, the the side loops are growing. And this brings us to um, to the things that are that are maybe unfavorable you know, for patch array antennas or, or in their application in WISP networks. And one of them is there are side lobes. And as I said, um, as soon as you, so the, here you see an example of how one patch radiates. If you put more, you st start see in the near field radiation that, the, that one main beam 
is formed, which is great. That's what we want, you know, higher gain in there. But there's also side lobes which start appearing. And this is because of the physics of uh, an array, a so-called array effect. And this happens regardless of what's the basic building block of an antenna array because of the wave interference. Yeah? Because you have multiple sources, yeah, or in this case, multiple patches that, I, that are fed with the same signal, uh, you, you, you know, the waves from, from each of these patches start to add. And there is so-called interference. Somewhere it's constructive, somewhere it's uh, destructive. So where it's constructive, you get a maximum or a lobe. Yeah, in, in our case, main lobe and the side lobes. And where it's destructive, you have the minima, yeah, which is the which is the blank spaces between the side lobes. And that's uh, that's something that's just uh, you know the physics of these antennas. There is really no way around it and avoiding it. Another source of the side lobes in the patch array antennas is actually the feed lines. So the feed lines are inevitable because we have to bring the RF signal to the patches somehow. So typically uh, the feed lines is a network uh, of, a thin, of, a, of a thin metal stripes, which basically branch the signal from the, uh, from the coaxial connector to however many branches we need to be able to feed each uh, and every single patch. And unfortunately, these, um, um, uh, these feed lines have their own resonant frequencies and their own radiation, which adds even more side lobes you know, on top of those um, uh, side lobes, which are stemming from the array effect we explained in the previous slide. So not only that, you know, so one of the Thanks is the radiation of the of the feed lines, but there is also uh, something called lateral radiation, yeah, which uh, which is caused by the surface waves, and this is basically the same RF signal, you know, with which you feed the the, the patches themselves, which propagates along the surface of the of the substrate itself. Again, it's an undesirable property of the patch antennas. And which results into, into yet more side lobes. And uh, here we can see an example of how the feed lines will radiate. So when we look closer and when we just want to see how the feed lines radiate, so we remove the, the, the patches themselves and simulate just that structure, this is what you come to. Uh, it's, it's the radiation pattern of the feed lines themselves. Yeah, so you can clearly see that indeed the, the you know the feed lines definitely do cause uh, an additional radiation, and you can you can see it actually it's not negligible because the maximum gain of these side lobes is around four and a half dBi. And a typical answer uh, a manufacturer and WISP industry would give to you know, the issue of the side lobes with patch arrays is to use uh, all kinds of metal shields and aftermarket shielding kits, you know, examples of which you can, you can see in this slide. So how do they actually work? What do they actually do? So seeing the sim simulation of the near field uh, near the antenna, and so now when you look at the antenna from the top, this is what you'll see. And, and the left side is the result for an antenna, patch array antenna without any shield. And you can see, well, it radiates in the, in the main direction we want yeah, from the bottom up, but then there's a lot of radiation kind of bending around the edge of the antenna and going all the way to the back and well, resulting into the antenna radiating pretty much everywhere. So on the right side, you can see the same antenna simulation, but with a shield, which you can see as, that, as those two wings on the side. Yeah? And Mind you, the shield is sold to you with the hope that, okay, this should mitigate the, uh, the side lobe radiation. But as you can see, um, the fields still bend around the edge of the shield itself, and there is still strong radiation in the back. So unfortunately, these shields really don't do much to the side lobes uh, the patch array antenna suffer from. They sort of rearrange the side lobes, they made them pointing in different directions. Maybe somewhere they're, you know, they're a little bit smaller, but altogether, 
the effect is really is really negligible to non-existent. And here is the same example, but uh, looking at the far fields of these two antennas. Yeah, so on the left, again, an antenna without any back shield. You can see substantial uh, lobes in the backward direction. And on the right side, you can see, okay, the, uh, the antenna with, uh, with the shield. Yeah, so the main lobe changed a little bit. It's a little bit more pointy. Okay, maybe the, uh, the maximum gain is a little bit higher. Yeah, but looking at the side lobes in the back, you'll see that, well, the shape has changed a little bit, but other than that, they're, they're, still, they're still there. And this is how, this is yet another look on, uh, another view on the, on the side lobes of the patch array antennas. So on the left, you can see how the coverage looks like with, with the, you know, using an antenna without any shield. So, yeah, some you know, typical coverage. You have those uh, back lobes uh, close to the antenna and the oval coverage uh, provided by this antenna. But on the right side, you see the you see the coverage provided by that antenna with the shield. Yeah, so you see that the the main beam actually and the coverage pattern itself has actually changed substantially. Yeah, so especially. Uh, for the customers who are sort of near the edge of the sector or the coverage area, um, they, they might actually experience uh, their service getting even worse, where you actually uh, deploy an antenna with the shield, hoping that it will improve something. You know? So again, uh, the conclusion for the, uh, for the, for the patchery antennas with the shields is that, well, you might as well just by a different antenna simply because the shields really don't mitigate the side lobes at all. But there is a way to go around it. And one of the solutions is shown here. So here you see an example of a patch, a circular patch uh, with a uh, air core. So on the right side, you can see the side view and there's an air core, meaning that there is nothing there. The substrate was melt away and they're also fed by a coaxial cable from the bottom. Yeah, so the coaxial feed from the bottom ensures that the, you know, the radiation, parasitic radiation from the feeding lines is not there. And the air core ensures that the, or mitigates to some degree uh, the parasitic radiation through the surface wave, yeah, which, we, which we talked about before. And on the left, you can see the structure, antenna structure looking from the top. So on top of those two things, uh, there is also metal fences, which are, which are just dashed lines of metal between the patches to separate them even better. And here you can, on the right side, you see the result, uh, resulting radiation pattern. So there are two lines. One is for the, uh, for the azimuth cut and one is in the elevation. Yeah, so, of course, the azimuth cut is pr pretty wide because it's a, it's a vertical, uh, vertical antenna array or patch array. And um, the red one shows us the elevation plane. And now we can see the, the green line, dashed line, shows us that the side lobes are more uh, than 20 decibels below the main lobe, which is really amazing result for a patch array antenna. But as anything in RF engineering, this comes at a, um, at a, at a price. Everything is a trade-off. And one of them is that the, the bandwidth of this, uh, of this antenna is very narrow. And that's because we removed those feed lines, which extend you know, the, the bandwidth of patch array antennas typically. But because now we're fitting them uh, uh, with the coaxial probe from the bottom, well, that additional bandwidth is gone. And not to say that the, the price for this kind of antenna would be a lot higher than what you're used to paying for for your typical patch array antennas in the WISP industry. So probably um, many WISPs would be very much hesitant to to actually to actually buy this type of an antenna. Another possible solution to uh, to the parasitic radiation or the side lobes of the of the patch array antennas are uh, frequency selective surfaces, yeah, and that's a, um, yeah, that's a, that's that metal profile on which the antenna is attached, that basically um, suppresses that um, tangential 
radiation to the side. Yeah? So it mitigates the side lobes in the azimuth direction. Yeah? And this is the solution we call back shield and we, that we use for uh, our patch array antenna sector. And here is the result uh, of how, or comparison of how um, patch array antenna works with and without the back shield. So on the left, you can see uh, an antenna radiation pattern without the back shield. So the, you know, looking at the azimuthal side lobes, you can see they're, they're strongly present as we would expect. But looking on the right, the antenna with the back shield, we can see that these side lobes are effectively mitigated which is really great because that's, uh, that's exactly what's the, what the back shield is supposed to do. But looking at this same example uh, from the side, you know, we can see we, comparing the side lobes in the elevation, you know, there is really not much difference. You know, so with or without the back shield, um, uh, these uh, side lobes in the elevation plane are still there, maybe somewhat you know, rearranged, pointing in slightly different directions, but nevertheless, still strongly present. And these are the side lobes um, caused uh, by, the, by the array effect we talked about before. And unfortunately, this is, um, again, the natural property of the, any antenna array, and therefore it's actually impossible to, to remove completely. Another of the issues with the patch arrays are, is actually their low beam efficiency. Yeah. So what is beam efficiency? It's the ratio of the energy an antenna radiates that's contained in the main lobe to the energy that an antenna radiates, uh, to the total energy an antenna radiates. So effectively it tells us what part of the energy antenna radiates is in the main lobe. Yeah, so beam efficiency can have, can have values from zero to 100%, where 100% is the best, uh, meaning that an antenna has literally zero side lobes. And the, the lower it is, uh, the more side lobes an antenna has. It's that simple. So as a WISP, uh, you should definitely use antennas with as high beam efficiency as possible. And here you see an example yeah, of a typical patch array antenna. So 58% beam efficiency means that this 58% it radi of energy this antenna radiates is in the main lobe. So what about the remaining 42%? Well, obviously it must be in the side lobes because anything outside the main, main lobe is a side lobe, right? Uh, so this is a, uh, this is, basically actually a very simple and effective measure of how to compare antennas uh, with the, in terms of the side lobe or noise mitigation uh, capability. So, you know, the higher beam efficiency an antenna has, the better it mitigates the noise. And here we show examples of uh, sector antennas uh, WISPs use in unlicensed five gigahertz band. And you can see that the, the patch array sectors are, are on the tail of the beam efficiency performance. So, you know, anything between 58 to 69%, uh, that's the beam efficiency these antennas can typically achieve. And all, you can also see we're showing some horn sectors there, yeah, which uh, are just to highlight that actually not as, you know, as soon as you have the horn, it doesn't mean that its beam efficiency is high. Uh, it really takes considerable effort to, to actually optimize uh, an antenna or a horn antenna more specifically to have a high beam efficiency. So unfortunately, because of the physics uh, of the patch array antennas, their beam efficiencies are pretty low, meaning that they, they you know, this is really the ultimate measure of uh, the noise mitigation capability yeah? because it's a clear number and it's a, it, that is based on the properties of an antenna. Yeah? So obviously, it's as simple as the higher number wins. Yeah? The higher the beam efficiency is, the better an antenna suppresses the noise. And this, these are the antennas WISPs should definitely use in their networks because um, the noise or interference is the number one problem in WISP networks. So yet another issue uh, with the patch arrays is, uh, is their unbalanced performance. And this uh, translates into two things. So first, looking on the left graph, you see how the gain of 
atypical patch array antenna changes with changing frequency. And you can see that it's changing a lot. At the beginning of the of the useful bandwidth, you know, it's pretty low. Actually, it's almost non-existent. It's around two uh, or close to zero decibels. Then, it, okay, then it grows up and then it's somewhat stable, let's say from 5.4 to 5.9 gigahertz, and then it goes down again. And that's, that's unfortunate because you cannot really use, effectively use all the channels you have at hand. Because, you know, seeing a clear channel you want to switch to, by doing so, you might actually lose quite a lot of decibels in the single strength, which, you know, leaves you just, well, you know, wondering what, what do I do now? So that's one part of the problem. And the second is that the horizontal and vertical polarization curves are, are different too. Yeah. So when you're using different, uh, so using the, the two radio channels you have, um, their performance is actually different at the same frequency, which is again another undesirable property because you cannot rely on the performance of such antenna. And on the right, you see how the radiation pattern of patch array antenna in vertical and horizontal polarization may look like. So again, there is a mismatch, you know, meaning that the, the radiation pattern is simply different in, in each polarization, which again, another undesirable um, property um, of the patch array antennas as you as you switch between the polarizations, you will see a different coverage and your customers might eventually see a different quality of, of the internet connection you're selling them. And the list goes on. Uh, there, is, uh, there is definitely more issues still. And mind you, these are the parameters that are actually important in WISP networks because um, you want your antenna to have high beam efficiency. You want your antenna to have very high frequency stability. You want your antenna to have wide bandwidth. You want your antenna to be mounted easily. Yeah? So we're not just picking these parameters um, you know, based on our whim, but actually based on, um, based on considering what's important for this particular application in WISP networks in unlicensed frequency bands. So looking at the frequency stability of patch array antennas, we see that uh, the side lobes and the main lobe are actually changing substantially with the frequency. And that's, um, as I mentioned, it's really undesirable in WISP networks because you cannot rely on the, on the coverage you're seeing at one frequency. You know, as you change the channel, the coverage will change, the noise background will change, inevitably because of the frequency instability of the radiation pattern the patch arrays have. And here you see another view on the frequency instability. And this, is a, this is a simulation, the closest thing to reality because we really, you know, this animation you see is a result of simulation with the real uh, 3D radiation pattern of this antenna and how it changes with frequency. So you see the frequency changing in the lower right corner. And, and you can see how the cover changes with the, with the frequency. Yeah? So this is really speaking for itself, you know. As you change the channel, uh, the coverage changes substantially. Talking about the mounting, uh, typically these patch array antennas are having quite complicated mounting system uh, that is composed of many uh, many parts that are that are easy to easy to lose, uh, especially as you climb high high up on a tower. Uh, which which can be quite difficult uh, in terms of the the save installation and the time actually spent on the tower. So typically, the patch array antennas um, mounting mounting uh, mechanism is quite cumbersome and and uh, not really user friendly. But patch arrays also have their strengths, and one of them is their scalable gain. So this is the example of, uh, of how the radiation pattern of a typical patch array looks. And we see, again, as we now we already understand that you know, having a vertical patch array, we see, uh, we see the radiation pattern being squeezed in the elevation plane, you know, while in the, in the azimuth plane, uh, the shape of the radiation pattern is still similar to that single patch array antenna. And... Um, 
Right. This is something you're, you're of course, used to from your daily operations in your REST networks. Um, so as we grow the number of patches in an array, we see the we see the the main load thinning down, yeah, and that definitely puts a limit on how big the gain. I mean, despite that, you know, we can put as many patches into an array as as we want, which is great because we can grow the gain and thus, you know, increase keep increasing the distances which we can cover. The definite limit on the number of patches is actually the beam width in the elevation plane. Because, you know, as you know, with, for example, these 32 patches, the, the beam width becomes so narrow, but so narrow that it's actually very difficult to provide that sectorial coverage. Yeah, you, we all know that uh, the, the down tilt is a very sensitive setting. You, know, you have to be very careful uh, with how you adjust the down tilt of the patch array antennas. And this is exactly why, you know, because the thin uh, radiation pattern in the elevation plane causes that, you know, anything beyond a few degrees of the down tilt, the coverage is gone, you know? And if you think that, well, I want a really high gain patch array antenna, why don't I get it? Well, this is why, you know, because it would be extremely difficult to aim these antennas such that they would provide reasonable um, coverage area. Which would result, I mean, let's assume, um, okay, this is, this is what happens when you have a patch array with many, uh, with many patches stacked on top of each other. And this is how the coverage looks. You, know, you, you experience that the, the null zone near the tower is actually increasing with the growing amount of patches. Yeah, okay, you get the gain, but then you're losing the coverage. Yeah, so that's, again, another trade-off. Uh, which makes uh, which makes the patch arrays uh, more difficult to use and more difficult to scale for higher gain. So another strength of the patch array is uh, is their cost. Yeah, they're very uh, they're very attractively priced, and that's simply because the the printed circuit board technology is a very old technology and uh, it's very well developed. Yeah, so it's very cheap to manufacture. The patch array antennas, which you know, makes them makes them also cheap for the for the end consumer. So this is actually really great you know, because that's something, especially when you're starting out, you're of course very happy to to have an antenna that doesn't cost much. I mean, which might be good for the starters, but in the long run, you know, you'll you'll definitely notice that the noise is actually uh, a problem and a growing problem in West networks, and then you have to start looking at other antennas as well. So scaling the horn, I mean, scaling the, the patch array for higher gain is very easy. Yeah, you, all you need to do is to grow the area of the, of the printed circuit board, meaning stack more patches. Yeah, it's as simple as that. So, and for example, here you see a comparison of a 18 dBi patch array and a 24 dBi patch array at five gigahertz. So, if you increase the print circuit board area five times, you get six decibels higher gain, which is really nice because uh, you only you only increase the the area of the antenna and yeah, not the volume, and um, that's very attractive because the again the printed circuit board is uh, is is a technology that it's very well developed and and um, it's very cost friendly. Yeah? So having a patch array with higher gain. Is actually doesn't come at a at a very much increased price. So let's sum it up. Uh, with the patch arrays, it's very easy to achieve high gain of the main lobby, yeah? and that's by simply stacking more and more patches. But again, there's a limitation to that to that beam width. Their cost is also very attractive, which is also one of the reasons why WISPs use them so widely, I mean, besides also the historical reason that that was pretty much the only antenna that was available for the sectorial coverage back in the day. And they're also very easy to manufacture. Uh, so they're, um, they're ubiquitous all around the world uh, because they're also used in other applications, like uh, especially the, the cellular industry has, has really pushed uh, the the popularity of these antennas uh, above and beyond but there is a lot of uh, a lot of cons of the patchery antennas so their their frequency dependence 
that's that's definitely a thumbs down. Uh, there are side lobes, which unfortunately we cannot avoid. I mean, okay, we could, but it becomes really expensive. So nobody really does that. And uh, also the other parasitic radiations, which are which are difficult to deal with. And again, that high gain is actually a really great thing, but it has its limits simply because the coverage area is uh, is difficult to achieve as you grow that gain. Now, not to say that also mounting these antennas on the tower becomes uh, or is typically cumbersome. So, and if you watched our previous webinar uh, about horns, uh, we now bring you a comparison uh, of these two types of uh, sector antenna technology. So in terms of high gain, the patch arrays uh, are a little bit better, but the horns are not far behind. And honestly, um, the other properties like uh, the, the lack of side lobes or high beam efficiency of horns really, really uh, compensate for those one or two decibels uh, of the gain difference very well. So you may lose two decibels in the signal strength, but you gain even good 10, 15 decibels in decreased noise floor, yeah, which is a trade-off you definitely you know, should be happy to do simply because it's the signal to noise ratio that matters the most, not the signal strength alone. And if the signal to noise ratio is higher, the radio can leverage higher uh, modulation encoding scheme rates and overall throughput can be higher. So in terms of the gain stability, horns are definitely the winner here. As we saw, uh, the patch array the radiation pattern changes substantially, whereas with the horn, uh, it barely changes at all. As I mentioned, uh, horns do not have any side lobes, which means their beam efficiency is between 93 up to actually 99%. For example, the ultra horn has beam efficiency 99%, you know, which is really amazing and really unmatched in terms of noise suppression and WISP industry. Whereas patch arrays, unfortunately, do have a lot of side lobes, which are avoidable. Right, but the cost is really way too much for uh, for the WISP industry altogether. In terms of bandwidth, the horns are also uh, very good. They definitely cover uh, a wider bandwidth than the patch arrays do. And again, with patch arrays, it's possible to make them make them a wide band. But then again, there comes the trade off with other properties. Yeah. And the pattern stability is very high with horns, whereas unfortunately with patch arrays, there is, uh, there is very little of that, as well as the balance between the horizontal and vertical, uh, vol vertical polarizations of these antennas, because um, uh, simply because all these parameters, yeah, the horizontal vertical balance, pattern stability, uh, and this amount of side lobes really are all those parts components that are adding to the to the quality of, of the perceived service from the side of your customers. Yeah, so you want you want no side lows or high beam efficiency. You want a very high pattern stability. You want an antenna to have a very balanced horizontal and vertical polarizations because those are those building blocks that ensure that your WISP networks and license bands will, uh, will be stable and reliable and with consistently high overall throughput. So horns, on the other hand, are uh, uh, more expensive to manufacture, obviously because they're, they're basically like, you know, a, the metal, full metal structures uh, with, some, uh, with some complicated ridges inside. So yes, they may be more expensive, but uh, they can be definitely, the manufacturing process can be optimized to the level uh, that these antennas uh, are attractive even in WISP industry. While the patch arrays are typically one of the cheapest antennas, you know, which is really a great, uh, great attraction for WISPs. So in the RF element, we, we try to, we are leading the WISP industry in terms of antenna performance, and we deliver a solution or the solution to the problem with noise by providing you the, the horn antenna technology that rejects the noise uh, to, together with our uh, near zero loss twist board ecosystem, which also makes the radios uh, very easy and simple to install. 
and uninstall. And all of these properties combined really provide you with the unlimited scalability options. So no longer you are limited by the hardware in terms of how big your WASP network can be. The only limitation is actually your imagination. And I invite you to check our YouTube channel where you'll find the playlist called with Traveler, where we traveled around the world and talked to a bunch of our customers and asked them how they, um, what's their experience with our products. So if you don't take it from us, we get it. Uh, but, you know, check those videos and see what other WISPs think about our antenna technology. Other YouTube channel we have is called Inside Wireless. And these are short few minute educational videos about all kinds of concepts and ideas from, uh, from the WISP world. And where do you are, you know, experienced WISP uh, or just starting out, it doesn't really matter. You can refresh or uh, get some uh, a better understanding of uh, all kinds of concepts from our engineering world. We also have a online discussion forum called rflab.com. Uh, we check this forum daily. So if you have any questions about our products, this is definitely the place to ask besides uh, our social media pages and yeah, it's a really, really great resource. You can search through the questions that uh, have been already asked. Uh, it's a really great um, knowledge base for, for our customers. So uh, that's it from me today. And I hope you have a nice rest of the day and bye-bye.